Cajun Artificial Heart Laboratory. Well, that's quite a mouthful. It's an interesting blend of words. It has a bit of a story to it. In 1964, the National Institute of Health started the Artificial Heart Program. Some would say that by the end of the decade, we would have our first artificial heart. Sounds vaguely familiar. Although, it took until the early 80s to really get someone on a long-term life support with an artificial heart. And even then, there were lots of complications. So as a young person entering this field, there's a big question. After 50 some odd years of research, how can I make an impact here? What is there left to do? What do we know? Well, being an engineer, you start to dissect the problem. You begin to look at what exactly are we trying to achieve with this? And it becomes sort of a personal quest, too, because with cardiovascular disease, it touches all of us. So a quick show of hands, who has some form of cardiovascular disease in their family or has been touched by it in some way? Well, you're not alone. Still, after 50 some odd years of intense research, nearly a trillion dollars worth, we still have close to 70 and a half million deaths per year, and that was in 2012. And that number is expected to balloon over the next couple of years. Monetarily, this represents $320 billion in costs. These are not the dollars associated with finding the cure. These are not the dollars associated with other diseases caused from this. These are direct and indirect costs for that particular disease. So still a huge problem in our day and age. Additionally, what we're finding is that Brazil, Russia, India, and China are coming onto the medical device market. These are markets that previously didn't have a whole lot of healthcare, didn't have medical device access. However, with globalization, the markets are flattening, and these people are now starting to have access to the solutions that we have had in America and Europe for some time. Problem is, these individuals are much more diverse than we are from a European-American standpoint. There are different body types, there's different expectations with activity, lifestyle, and even access to healthcare, even at this point. So the problem has gotten much more complex, and even more so in the time going forward. The question becomes, what exactly do we need to start looking at? Well, I was getting on a plane some, some while back, and I thought about this. What other industries are faced with monumental tasks of designing devices that are supposed to go through a myriad of conditions, be safe, and get us to where we want to be? However, when I thought about it, I said, well, you have very well-trained pilots. There's a lot of professionalism in the industry, and not exactly letting the passengers run the, run the plane. Well, I began to think about automotive as well. And I remember back to a symposium meeting where I was speaking with an engineer from a major car manufacturer, and he said, anytime, anywhere, under any conditions, and don't expect anyone to take care of it in the meantime. So I thought, maybe this is a great industry to see what they're doing. What sort of solutions are they bringing uh, to bear? What I began to found was, is from that very statement that their engineering practices connected with what they expected their things to do. They're bringing these types of conditions, all the types of things that these devices are going to see back to the, to the design process. So the point was, how do we simplify the problem of cardiovascular devices? Well, when you think of the heart, the heart is a muscle. The primary purpose is to push blood. However, as anyone knows from muscles, you got to feed them, you got to take care of them, and you got to be in shape. Well, with diseased individuals, that's not the case. So when you begin to look at how do we assess the heart's function, what you find is that there's certain classifications. In this case, the New York Heart Association's classification, one being good, four being on the precipice of receiving uh, a heart assist technology. If you look a little closer at it, what you find are that there are certain key words. As you get worse, there's a difference in the expectations for activity. What's kind of interesting when you begin to think about someone that has heart failure, 
that at a stage four, I mean, the goal is to get them to a stage one, right? You're, you're expecting them to get better. And if you look at our own classification system, it's built on increasing the amount of activity, right? It's not saying a very controlled walk down a hospital corridor, 25 paces, turning around, returning to the bed. This is activity, right? Mild, strenuous activity. Furthermore, when you begin to talk with the physicians, and you begin to understand how these devices are used, implanted, you begin to really have an appreciation for the art and the experience associated with these individuals. And I see a very strong parallel between surgeons and tailors. That someone built on years of experience, they can see something for the first time, take a few quick measurements, and get it right. That's an amazing amount of skill. So as an engineer, of course, it's the fact, how do we find out what this is? What is the je ne sais quoi behind the successful surgeons that are getting their patients to live uh, on these devices, having only seen that heart valve, for instance, when the chest was open the first time? That's pretty remarkable from an engineering standpoint. Furthermore, it was capturing it and bringing that information back to the engineers that are developing the devices. There are surgeons that interact with engineers but for the most part, they like to keep the engineers uh, away uh, from the surgeons. So the question became, what can I do to help? When I looked at that mountain, this is the road that I chose. Being a son of MBAs, a mission statement seemed appropriate. And it was to deliver research capabilities through a mix of both testing tools and computational tools build the tool bin, help others, and help them understand how to make their devices better. So if you think about it, in a market of many medical devices, a, uh, an option-saturated market, you focus on the services, right? You help those individuals that are trying to achieve and get through their own pass in the mountain. So this became the Artificial Heart Laboratory. As part of that, what was the dissection of the problem? Well, going back to the heart being a muscle, the first challenge is moving fluid. Wasn't gonna focus on the drugs, wasn't gonna focus on some of the other aspects. I was gonna focus on, let's make sure that the heart can function and serve its primary responsibility the best it can. And how was this artificial heart laboratory going to do that? Well, we're gonna focus on particular devices, one being a heart assist pump. So if you see here with a heart, there's a pump strapped onto the side of it. That pump is a continuous flow pump. It's pumping constantly. The heart is a pulsal mechanism. And much like the muscle that I communicated is, we know that it has to accommodate change. We're not in the legs and our uh, muscles in our legs are not walking at a specified gait. They're accommodating the activity, the terrain changes, so, and the heart does the same thing. So if we have a continuous flow pump, that makes it very difficult to understand how the body is going to interact with this, and how is this device that's meant to help someone that's very sick make them better. The second type of devices we're going to focus on are heart valves. As you can see up here, there's two different types, and the catch-22 associated with these devices are that the mechanical valves last longer but need more drugs. The bioprosthetic valves don't last as long. And as anyone knows, pinching the end of a hose, that that little bit of pressure can make a big difference in the amount of power it takes to keep the flow going through it. So the heart valves are very important beyond just the active pumping of the heart. So now we have this artificial heart laboratory. And how are we going to attack these two, you know, helping these two device industries? Well, we're going to further dissect the problem, and we're going to focus on the conditions and the anatomy. So as I mentioned before, the problem is getting more diverse. In that diversity, we're not only having an expectation of increased activity, but we're having the different shapes that people are going to present to those devices. So conditions first, what do we have? We have blood pressure that's changing over the course of time. And as anyone knows, fainting episodes, falling over, being startled, your heart accommodates to that. One of the things I found that was very interesting is that heart pumps, heart pump recipient patients receive pacemakers. So 
in order to simplify the problem, we're forcing a disease individual to have a rhythm that can be anticipated and expected. Well, it would seem that moving forward, we should allow for the accommodation of change, because we're looking to get these people to be more active. Secondly, as part of the research, we need to be able to make this happen. Well, it's all well and good if we want to create these activity changes, but how are we going to do this? Well, we've got to get very good at creating those conditions on the bench. We've got to prove that these are the conditions these devices are going to see. And part of that is that are those computational models I talked about earlier, but also the ability to actually deliver this on the bench. And what I found here is that we're very good at making things. Kadiana has a fantastic manufacturing base and engineering base that I can draw upon. The second part of the work, developing the shapes. So you can see here the anatomy associated, the blood flowing uh, through these structures can be very complex. These are not simple pipes. These are not simple chambers. These are very complex uh, arrangements. So one of the other points that I like about my research is that I'm drawing upon open resources. These are resources of Visible Human Project is a nationally funded resource through the National Library of Medicine. As part of that, all researchers can draw upon this. So it's a part of, let's all work from the same page. Let's not collect our own data. Let's work from common repositories so people can share their ideas openly and openly validate their technologies. But we've also got good, we also have to get good at capturing shape. And as part of capturing that shape, we can take patient data for morphologies or shapes that doctors deem as being necessary for certain devices to function within. As engineers, we had to become good at creating those shapes. So as part of this, now we're moving towards actually delivering what the environment these devices are gonna function within. We're trying to show how these devices are gonna work against all those different people we're looking to affect. As part of that, we're matching this with modern technology. 3D printing has opened huge doors with realizing shape. As part of that, now we can print these molds so we can have the same sort of elastic structures that these devices are supposed to function within, where classically they were not tested in, in this way. So now we're really connecting both the environment and the conditions associated with these devices back to the design process. We're beginning to sort of revisit some of the age-old regulations that are associated with these device certifications. As part of that, in sort of the analogy of the tailor, is that at this point in time, with the current certifications, we're trying to fit a very limited shape and function of a device to a variety of people. And that becomes very difficult because there's only so much, in essence, fabric that you can add to this without un addressing the underlying issue of an improper fit. So we've got to make sure that devices that going forward fit us correctly. So now we have this artificial heart laboratory. But there's one last term associated with it, and that's cages. Kadiana has an incredible health resource network and manufacturing base. And when I came here and looked at UL, I saw the promise of this. And I got to meet the students and get to know the people in the community. And I felt like that was one of the strongest resources that I was going to be able to draw upon, were the people. And so what became was the Cajun Artificial Heart Laboratory. And that's where we are today. And I would be remiss to say that this has been achieved in a vacuum. The variety of people that I get to interact with on a daily basis that have phenomenal creativity. And as part of that, I think that's one of the best resources this laboratory has, is the talent. I invite you to keep uh, an eye on what we're doing. We have some remarkable accomplishments coming forward. And I want to thank the individuals on this slide and the others that uh, didn't submit their pictures in time. Uh, for their participation as well. As a college professor, I have the phenomenal, uh, phenomenal benefit of working with these very bright and talented individuals that are not biased by history and see the creativity in new and novel solutions.
So I thank them and I thank you tonight for your patience. Thank you.